It's the 4th of July 2020, qualifying day before the Austrian Grand Prix. After making his debut as a full-time F1 driver the day before, Nicholas Latifi is making final preparations for his first ever F1 qualifying session. However, 45 minutes into the final practice session, Latifi spun and hit the wall on the exit of Turn 1. This was the first crash of the 2020 F1 season, and for a driver who was already being criticised for taking the seat of Nick de Vries, 2019's F2 champion, it's hardly the start he wanted. Later in the day, he went on to qualify last, half a second behind P19, and the following day he'd finish 11th, last of the finishes. This weekend went on to set the tone for Latifi's whole career to date, and the reason I'm making this video is because in 2022, Latifi is carefully crafting one of the worst seasons I've ever had the misfortune to watch. Latifi's running 21st in a 20-car championship just like Nikita Mazepin did, and failed to score points when his teammate who had never raced a lap in F1 could, and we'll get onto that in a little bit. I think it's fair to say that when Latifi joined F1 two years ago, he wasn't the best candidate for the job. Sure, he'd finished second in the F2 championship, but in the nicest possible way, the competition wasn't as tough as it usually is in F2, so I think the P2 looks a bit better on paper than it actually is. In 2018, for instance, Latifi was Alex Albon's teammate, just as he is this year, and he scored less than half the points of Albon, finishing a lot lower in the championship. We already know that Latifi isn't as good as Albon though, so the 2018 F2 championship isn't exactly a game-changing bit of evidence. My point with Latifi not being the best candidate though, is that he was beaten by someone who also didn't have a great season in 2018. And yet, because he was bringing all the money to Williams, Nick de Vries was sent to Formula E. And sure, Formula E is still a good series to race in, but as an F2 champion, you should really be given a route into Formula 1. Anyway, de Vries not getting an F1 seat isn't my issue here. It's the fact that Latifi did get a seat, and although his year was sort of wasted away thanks to being in the worst car on the grid, I'd still rather a seat were given to someone who genuinely deserved it. But as we know, Williams weren't in a position to do that, and needed the money over the talent. Fast forward to 2021 though, and Williams were doing much better, both financially and competitively, and credit where it's due, Latifi technically scored Williams' first points since 2019 in Hungary, where he finished 7th, with Russell behind him in 8th. However, this was one of the few highs of Latifi's season. He went on to qualify 9th in the Belgian Grand Prix while Russell was 2nd. Now, I'm not saying that 9th was bad for Latifi, because the Williams still wasn't exactly a speed demon. It was a very solid, wet qualifying session, and in fact something I've noticed about him is that his wet qualifying is usually pretty good. Anyway, the single point he scored in Belgium as well as the six he scored in Hungary contributed to all seven of Latifi's career points, and even though Russell only went on to score another two in other occasions that season, it was still clear to see why Russell is now driving for Mercedes and Latifi isn't. Thing is though, it seems that Russell's got better this year, while Latifi has got worse. A lot worse. Following a P16 finish in the Bahrain Grand Prix, only ahead of Nico Hülkenberg in the Aston Martin, Latifi had what can only be described as an awful weekend in Saudi Arabia. He hit the wall in free practice, crashed out of Q1 and came on the radio to blame the car, and then crashed out again in the race, again coming on the radio, this time saying, I don't know what happened there. To avoid any confusion, I'll tell you what happened there. There was a wall, and Latifi hit it. Now, the Williams didn't look like a great car to drive at the start of the season, and I doubt it's a good one now, but to crash twice in a weekend and instantly blame the car in both instances isn't a good look, especially when your teammate is keeping it out of the wall with no issues. Even in the interviews after the race, Latifi kept reiterating that the rear seems to let go very unpredictably, and the balance is all over the place. And sure, maybe it is, but when the team is paying you to drive for them, then you need to be making them look good, and Latifi's constant complaining isn't doing that at all. Next race was Australia, where Nicholas went for a closing gap next to Lance Stroll in qualifying, resulting in another big, totally avoidable damage bill for Williams. Of course, the incident was 50-50, with Stroll failing to check where he was going, and Latifi surprising Stroll by continuing to go flat out after going off track and rejoining behind him, but either way, Latifi was involved in another crash that was in part his fault. To be honest, I'm surprised he didn't blame the car for this one in some way. Latifi finished 16th, only ahead of Alonso who had some awful luck with strategy. Meanwhile, Alex Albon pulled off a crazy strategy which saw him take the hard tyres for all but one lap of the race. You can credit the team all you want for this strategy, but the fact is that Latifi would never have been able to pull it off. Albon was pulling away from the pack behind him even on 30 lap old hards. Do you think Nicholas Latifi would have been able to do that? Speaking of Latifi, he was 16th again in Imola, with Albon in 11th, and then 14th in Miami with Albon in 9th. Latifi did manage to finish ahead of Albon in Spain, however this was thanks to Albon having what Williams called extensive damage to the floor of his car right from the start. Latifi was outqualified by Albon by almost a second in Monaco, and then proceeded to put it into the wall on a lap behind the safety car. And you'll never guess what, he blamed it on the car again. Then came Baku, where Latifi was again last of the finishes with Albon in P12. The next race was his home race, and in it he finished 16th, and again behind Albon, who was 13th. 
To be fair, this was a smaller gap than usual, so that's something, I guess. Britain was a weird one, with Latifi out qualifying Albon in the wet, giving Williams their first Q3 as he did so. In the race, he fell back two places to P12, but we can't compare this to anything as Albon was crashed into at the start. Latifi didn't finish the Austrian Grand Prix thanks to floor damage, so we rejoined the season in France, where Latifi made a move on Magnussen which forced Kevin wide, then Latifi failed to leave him the space to rejoin, and therefore turned straight into him, pitching himself into a spin and no doubt causing some more damage to the car, which led to a retirement. Of course, Kevin could and maybe should have backed out, but at the same time, Nicholas shouldn't have forced him off and should have left him the space. Next came Hungary, which was a horrible race for both Williams cars, but as usual, it was Nicholas behind Alex at the flag. Belgium was, I think, Latifi's worst race before Italy, as while Alex Albon finished in the points again for the team, Latifi was last of the finishers in 18th. He was 18th again in the Dutch Grand Prix while Albon finished 12th, and that brings us to Italy. After free practice on Friday, Albon was diagnosed with appendicitis, and therefore had to miss qualifying and the race, meaning his car was to be driven by Nick De Vries. I feel it's important to mention at this point that De Vries has never raced a lap in F1 in his life, and had not driven the Williams since Spain. Side note, De Vries was driving the Aston Martin car in FP1, which means he's the first driver ever to drive two different cars in a single race weekend. Anyway, Nick was to stand in for Albon from FP3 the following day, and he managed to get 45 minutes of running from this session as a preparation for qualifying. Naturally, having driven the car for the whole season, and having been an F1 driver for three years now, Latifi was expected to be at the very least ahead of Nick De Vries in Monza. So, of course, that's exactly what didn't happen. De Vries outqualified Latifi by two hundredths of a second, which, although a small margin, was already worrying. But in the race, De Vries put the final nail in the coffin. Thanks to some penalties ahead, De Vries was starting 8th and Latifi was starting 10th. However, they made use of their starting positions pretty differently. On the De Vries side of the garage, he raced and defended brilliantly all race to finish 9th, while for Latifi, it was less good. Pace-wise, he was only a 10th off De Vries when you compare both of their fastest laps, but despite the close gap in pace, Latifi slipped back 5 places to finish 15th. And then, the icing on the cake was when he came on camera after the race and said that P15 was around where the car should be, which sounds an awful lot to me like blaming the car again. And in saying that 15th was the best the car could do, he was completely ignoring the fact that his teammate had finished 9th, and in doing so, sort of shot himself in the foot. If he'd said something like he was unlucky with track position, then that could at least be a reasonable excuse, but what he's actually saying is that his performance was average for the car, and someone on their Grand Prix debut who'd been sipping coffee in the Mercedes hospitality on Saturday morning was better than that. From the disappointing amount of crashes to the poor pace all season, to the constant blaming of the car, I don't see much reason why Williams would want to keep Latifi in F1 anymore. Honestly, this year he's not been much better than Mazepin was last year, and seeing as Williams have the long-term backing from Derilton Capital, it's not like they need the money from Latifi's dad anymore. Look, I'm sure he's a great person, but being a good person doesn't make you a good driver. De Vries is, as far as I know, without a job for next year. But given not only how adaptable he's shown himself to be, having used two different steering wheels and two different cars in a weekend, but also how much better he is than Latifi already, I see no reason as to why Williams shouldn't get rid of Latifi and put De Vries in the car. I know we shouldn't be drawing so many conclusions about De Vries from just the one race, but as a Formula 2 and Formula E champion, it's not like this is likely to be a fluke. I'm not really the biggest fan of him either, and I think I've made it clear in the last few minutes that I'm not a big fan of Latifi either, but I am a fan of Williams, and I want nothing more than to see them get the most out of their car, and with Latifi, they will never get that. So, my question to you is this. Is the Williams genuinely the slowest car this season and Albon is just a really good driver, or is the Williams a solid midfielder and Latifi is making it look like a backmarker? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm sorry for the tone of this video being a bit angry, I'd like to think they're not all like that, but in this case specifically, I'm just annoyed at the fact that there are so many drivers who should have been in F1 for the last three years, and yet Latifi is getting away with being miles below average. Even taking money into account, Latifi is still probably in the top 1% of racing drivers for pace, so calling him awful isn't exactly fair. It's just that there are several better choices than him at the moment, and therefore I think he has to go. Anyway, that's enough ranting for one video, so I will love you and leave you, and hopefully see you in the next one. Thank you for watching, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Bye!